Okay, we're going to begin. Thanks all for being here. Uh, I'm Simon Rosenberg from NDN, and um, grateful for you all turning out uh, today. We've got a wonderful program, and um, we also, I just want to acknowledge that Adam, Congressman Smith may have to run out at some point just to go vote. Uh, Congress is busy this week, so we're grateful he's been able to break away uh, and be with us today. Um, just in terms of how this is going to work is that we will, we are live webcasting this, uh, so when we go to the Q&A uh, portion, we'll be taking questions from folks online. Hello, Sue Brodsky, how are you? Uh, and uh, we'll be taking uh, questions from uh, people uh, over the internet as well as in the room, and there'll be plenty of time uh, for Q&A. So thanks to everybody who's here and also who's watching on, online. Um, our subject today, you know, we just, NDN did a major event last week uh, that was a preview of the Summit of the Americas that's coming up, and this, I see this as sort of a piece of that, continuing that same discussion. Uh, this is now a more immediate discussion about what's happening with the G20, but obviously we know that whatever is or isn't decided and whatever comes out of the communique from the G20 tomorrow, that this is going to be an ongoing process. And that what we're, what we're really facing in many ways is the end of the 20th century economy and the end of the 20th century construct that really helped govern uh, global economics and, and sort of the Pax Americana that existed uh, throughout the world. And we're entering really truly a new era of, of relationships around the world and uh, of America's role in the world. And it's something that NDN has been talking about a great deal over the last few years. And it's something we'll be spending a lot of time getting into today. Let me do the bios and, and all that now so we can get that out of the way and so we can just get into the, the talk. And, and the, the order will be, we're going to be, we're going to hear first from Dr. Rob Shapiro. Many of you know Rob. Uh, he is the head of our globalization initiative. He really is, I think, simply one of the leading left of center economists in, the, in America today. Uh, he's been writing, I think, as intelligently about what's happening in the global economy as to, just about anybody in Washington in the last few years. Rob was uh, in the served in the second Clinton term as Undersecretary of Commerce, and I like to say that we met in 1992 when Rob was the principal economic advisor to then Governor Bill Clinton, and when James Carville said it's the economy stupid, he was talking about Rob's arguments uh, about the economy and his analysis, and um, he's an old friend, and, and uh, we're really glad to have him here with us today. He's going to be giving his take on what's happening with the economic piece and where we stand on, on, on the uh, economic challenges in front of us. We're then going to hear from Congressman Adam Smith. Adam has is, is, uh, been a dear friend since before he was even elected to Congress. And I, liked, uh, I like your new bio, Adam. I'm going to read it here a little bit. He's lived his entire life in the Ninth District of Washington State and resides in Tacoma. Now in his seventh term, he, Adam serves on the, both the Armed Services Committee and House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. As a 13-year member of the House Armed Services Committee, he chairs the Subcommittee on Terrorism, Unconventional Threats, and Capabilities which oversees the nation's special operation forces and counterterrorism policy, among other critical areas. I want to say about Adam is that I think he's on, on, among the members that we work with. I think his understanding of what's happening around the world today, both from a traditional security standpoint, but also from an economic standpoint, and the connection between the two, right, is almost unparalleled in the House and the Senate today. And he, among other things, he was the author of the Global Poverty Act, uh, which was a wonderful piece of work who the co-sponsor in the Senate was Barack Obama. Uh, and, he's, and he's put his, in, as, a, as a large uh, strategy towards reducing conflict around the world is about investing in, in, the, in, in helping America get to the millennial development, uh, to commit America to reaching the millennial development goals uh, that were set out uh, that may seem like ancient history now, uh, Adam, given that what's happening in the economy today. But we're anxious to hear from Adam. And then finally, uh, somebody who all of our team here admires very much, and we're really glad that he's with us today, Dr. Moises Naim, who's the editor of Foreign Policy Magazine. He's written extensively on the political economy of international trade and investment, multilateral organizations, economic reforms, and globalization. He's the author or editor of eight books, numerous essays, professional articles, and his opinion columns are regularly published in the world's leading newspapers. We also are big fans of the new online uh, um, work that foreign policy is doing. Sam uh, Dupont, who's our daily writer, writes and quotes from it all the time. And I think he may be your biggest fan uh, here, and as a former staffer at, uh, or intern, right? Uh, intern at Foreign Policy. So, welcome everybody. Let's get on with it, Rob. Thanks. Great. Uh, thanks, Simon. 
Uh, it's a pleasure to see you all again, you know, even though you know, I, uh, I get tired of delivering bad news. Um, well, the world's political leaders are meeting today, and they're meeting under really very unusual circumstances. Uh, summits of this kind usually involve the ratification of understandings or agreements worked out in some detail long before the leaders meet under the kind of spotlight of a summit. Um, this time they're meeting in the midst of the worst uh, economic conditions in 80 years uh, globally. Not only have they not agreed to any set of responses, they and their advisors haven't come to a common view of what the problem is. Uh, instead, much of the value of this meeting will come from President Obama and Prime Minister Brown and President Sarkozy and President Medvedev, Chancellor Merkel and President Hugh listening to each other to learn how each of them sees the crisis affecting their own countries, what they see as its causes, who or what they blame, and what they're prepared to do. Since last weekend, when German officials leaked a communique drafted by Gordon Brown calling for coordinated uh, stimulus, leaked it in order to knock it off the table, uh, it's been clear that the summit is unlikely to produce a coordinated response in this area, in stimulus, which is generally politically the easiest step to take. Indeed, thus far, the United States, China, and Spain are virtually the only nations in the world that have initiated significant stimulus, uh, in part because the other major industrial countries have such extended safety nets that there's been less political pressure to stimulate. Um, but that doesn't mean the problem, the underlying problem, isn't as great. Uh, indeed, by, uh, in some judgments, the problem in Europe may be worse than in the United States. Um, the lack of some kind of coordinated response, um, even in the simple area of stimulus, is a real loss uh, because the crisis demonstrates the extraordinary degree to which globalization has integrated the economic trajectories and fates of the world's major economies. Part of this reflects the most highly globalized sector of all, which is finance, so that the products created in New York, whether they're mortgage-backed securities and credit default swaps or, or normal corporate paper, are traded furiously around the world. It may well be that the European banking system incurs as much or more damage as our own. Um, at a minimum, it's meant that the steps we've taken to bail out our own financial institutions were taken in part to protect the major institutions of our allies. This is an aspect of globalization. This was particularly clear in the early takeover of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Uh, which happened after the European governments informed the Bush administration that their own central banks were holding large quantities of Fannie and Freddie bonds. Um, it's not this, this phenomenon of the way in which globalization changes and, and a global business cycle is not limited to finance. Under globalization, the share of everything that's traded in the world across borders that is, the share of everything that's produced in the world and then traded across borders, jumped from 18% in 1990 to 30% in 2006. 30% of everything produced everywhere in the world, goods and services, were traded across some border. The result is that a severe economic shock, like the one shaking the world today, produces the, the main result of protectionism, which is, to see a drastic, which is to say a drastic drop in global trade without new laws. It does it naturally. Compared to one year before, exports in January of this year were down more than 20% in the United States. They were down 30% in Germany, France, Mexico, and Britain. They were down 30 to 40% in Korea, Italy, Canada, Japan, Argentina, and here's the big one in China. Um, and they're down more than 40% in Russia. Um, so we are seeing declines in global trade that we have never seen since the 1930s, coming as a natural result of a, of a uh, economic shock that spreads first through the financial system and then through the trading system um, around the world. Um, the, early, the other early result of all of this, of course, is rising unemployment everywhere in the world. So the world finds itself in not only a systemic crisis, 
but a cascading one as well. That is, it's a crisis that makes itself more and more serious through feedback effects, that's the systemic part, while also spreading across sectors and countries. That's the cascading effect. Um, in short, this is not an ordinary business cycle or, or an ordinary recession. And the normal steps to bring a country out of an ordinary recession aren't working. The chief response, monetary policy, is failing. We're running nearly zero interest rates today. We doubled the monetary base in four months. It usually takes four to five years to double the monetary base. Normally, we increase the monetary base one to two percent uh, a month. In um, October and November, we increased it 58 percent. In uh, December and January, we increased it another 50 percent. Uh, this is something that usually takes at least a half decade. We did it in four months. Um, and the sectors that are supposed to be most sensitive to monetary policy, housing, consumer durables, and business investment, all continue to fall. Uh, we are, in the classic sense, pushing on a string with monetary policy. The fiscal stimulus will help some, though not starting in the fall and early next year, but only on a temporary basis. Um, there are two fundamental reasons why this recession is so different. First, much of the core of the nation's financial sector, the whole system for distributing capital to businesses and, and households, can't operate normally. That's because central financial institutions are bankrupt or nearly so, or because they're trying to protect themselves against the next set of shocks. And new shocks are exactly what you have to plan for in a systemic cascading crisis. This, we have not seen all the stages of this crisis. There will be several more to come. Now that's the supply side. Conditions are no better on the demand side. Here what's unique in this crisis compared to other business cycles in the lifetime of everyone in this room um, is that people are holding back um, not simply because their incomes are down um, or because they've lost a job or they're afraid they might lose their job soon. That's what happens in every recession. You get a reduction in consumer demand because people's incomes have gone down. What's different this time is that in addition to that, people are also suddenly and starkly poorer. Over the last year, this crisis has evaporated $14 trillion in personal wealth in America. That's split nearly evenly between the loss in value in equities and the loss in value in housing values. That's about 20% of the value of everything in the U.S. economy has been wiped out in the last year. In economic terms, the shock isn't just in the flows, that's how much income you're taking in, it's also in the stock, what you're worth, apart from your income. The result is a fast, fast rising saving rate and fast falling consumption and fast falling business investment, which of course uh, responds to the prospect of consumption in the future. And that's why fiscal stimulus and monetary ease aren't working, or at least they're, they aren't enough. That's why this downturn is likely to last not the average, uh, the 12 to 14 months, which is average for a U.S. recession, but likely about three years. And that's why it's so vital that we implement effective programs to address the two critical underlying sectors in this crisis, housing and finance. That brings us to the same conundrum facing all those leaders in London this week. What's economically necessary is very, very difficult politically. We won't stop the wealth drain until we stabilize housing. And closely related, we can't stabilize banking until we stabilize the mortgage-backed security market. That won't begin to happen until we can bring the foreclosures driving down the value of both housing and those securities back to normal levels. But how do you help those in danger of defaulting on their mortgages and facing foreclosure without igniting a political firestorm from everyone else who holds a mortgage? Who says, why, why are they getting help when we're not getting help? Um, and we don't have enough money to help everybody, uh, everybody's mortgage. So far, the administration's plan addresses the availability of mortgage refinancing doesn't address foreclosures, really. But banks are very unlikely to refinance a homeowner who's facing foreclosure because, by definition, they're very bad credit risks. So this approach is very unlikely to be enough. 
This crisis also won't abate until we can normalize the foundations of the financial system. And that can happen so long as the system is dominated by institutions that are insolvent or very nearly so. So far, the administration's plan is to create a market for the, those institutions' bad assets by guaranteeing loans to private partnerships that want to buy those assets. That's a very clever way to create a market for, uh, for these uh, toxic assets. The problem is that the sick institutions that are holding these assets today have already written down the value on their books. So that unless the new buyers pay a lot more for the assets than the banks have already valued them on their own books, the plan won't make them any more solvent than they are today. Uh, this was the same problem with the Paulson plan um, last year, although the Paulson plan didn't have didn't even create the market for the assets it, uh, uh, that, the, that, that the Obama plan does. It's not likely to be enough. So just like the foreign leaders in London, our own leadership is still learning how this crisis is unfolding and what their options are. I'm not criticizing them for not fully understanding this yet um, or not being able to take the steps yet. This is unique. We don't have any models of this. We are all trying to figure this out as we go. It promises, this process promises to be an extended one. And that means that the crisis will be a protracted one. Um, it will take leadership of the kind not often seen to grasp the problem, accept the solutions, and then sell them to the American people. Now, extraordinary leadership is precisely what Barack Obama has promised the American people last year. Whether or not he can deliver, I think, will be the test that history will remember him for. Thank you. Uh, appreciate the economic analysis there. I think it's, it's all accurate, if a little bit depressing. Um, and are the challenges that we face. But I guess the good news is we kind of knew that going into November. Um, we knew, and I think the American people knew, that we had stepped over a cliff um, and it was going to take a lot of work to fix it. It's going to take a lot of work, a lot of effort, and a lot of time to get there. Uh, and hopefully what the Obama administration will continue to do is do a good job of being honest and explaining that and, and working our way out of it while letting people know that it's, it's going to take a little while. And I think uh, Rob outlined very, very well what those challenges are. I want to mention just one more and then uh, talk a little bit about the international peace issues that I work on. Um, and that is the, the challenge of protectionism. As you're going into an economy like this, there's several very basic lessons. You don't raise taxes, you don't cut spending, and you don't enact protectionist policies because that, in essence, is a tax cut. It drives up the cost of doing business. A tariff is a very straightforward tax. Um, but quotas and other non-tariff barriers also fundamentally drive up the cost of doing business at precisely the moment when, as, as Rob described, you can ill afford uh, any more driving down of people's economic activity. And that is precisely what this causes. And um, I don't want to continue on the doom and gloom side here, but we're in a lot of trouble on this issue. Um, and we need folks to start speaking up on this more aggressively. And it's creeping up on us from a lot of different directions. And I, I do believe that the Obama administration needs to be more forceful in talking about the dangers of protectionism and explaining it, and explaining why it would be so bad for the economy in this moment. We've got a lot of trade agreements that are hanging out there not being acted on. Um, that, that's unfortunate, particularly in the case of Korea, uh, because Korea is a huge economic trading partner. You know, we've been fighting tooth and nail in Congress for the last five or six years over things like Oman and Peru. Um, and as important as it is to keep a trade agenda moving forward, these are not large trading partners. They're not going to have a dramatic impact on our economic bottom line in this country. Those agreements were important because they represented the fundamental issue, should we do trade agreements or not? Are we going to move forward with the trade agenda? But in terms of economic impact, uh, they weren't that important. Korea is, and it sits out there not, not being acted on. But, but worse, than that, worse than that is some of the creep in other directions. And we actually, we have a trade war going on in the U.S., folks haven't heard about it, all over Mexican trucking. Um, and you can get into sort of the discrete issue as to, you know, whether or not Mexican trucks are safe, should they come across the borders, how do we negotiate that. But the bottom line is it was in 
the NAFTA agreement, um, that we would allow this to happen. We didn't. The clock ran out. And now Mexico has begun slapping tariffs on all manner of different goods that are out there. And by and large, you're not hearing much about this. Uh, there's no sense of urgency that I can see to fix this problem. And it's the first step down the road, I believe, of having the type of elevated trade war that we can ill afford. So we need to get back on track and have a trade agenda. Now, it does help uh, that Ron Kirk was confirmed as the U.S. Trade Representative. It also helps that it's Ron Kirk. Um, he's a good guy. Uh, he has the right policies on these issues, and I believe he is committed to moving the trade agenda forward. But one of the biggest messages I have is we need to urge all pieces of the Obama administration, Commerce, Treasury, whoever we're talking to, that this is something they need to get on their agenda to show that we can take positive steps. Because to the extent that we don't, whether it's not fixing the Mexican trucking problem, not passing the Panama Free Trade Agreement or Colombia um, or Korea, not going forward to try to get the Doha round started again, not continuing to negotiate a variety of different trade agreements out there, reactions come from the rest of the world. And that's how a trade war gets started. They, too, retreat. They, too, look for ways to protect their own products. Um, also, you can add into the mix the Buy America provisions that were in the stimulus bill. Now, the exceptions outweighed the rule on that. And if you really sort of dive into it, it is unlikely that the Buy America provisions that are contained in the stimulus bill are going to have much of a negative impact on our economy. But that's not the story in the rest of the world. If you read what they're saying about it, and I'm sure it's coming up at the G20 summit, they view those Buy American provisions as a dramatic problem and also to some extent license for them to react in a similar fashion. And then you elevate the trade war and you elevate protectionist policies and you drive up the cost to consumers and the cost of business in a moment when we can least afford to do that. So we need voices out there. And right now within Congress, they're hard to find. There's a very, very powerful group of folks um, who continue to see trade as a threat to the economy instead of an opportunity. And this despite the fact that we've stepped up and addressed many issues, many legitimate issues that have been out there for a while. It never made sense, and this is one of the things that, that came out of the WTO, um, that you would not negotiate labor and environmental protections as an essential part of trade. If you're setting up the rules for a global economy um, and talking about intellectual property and talking about investor rights and all of those things, then certainly uh, the rights of workers and efforts to protect the environment should be part of that discussion. But they are now. All of those agreements that I just mentioned have enforceable provisions in them on labor and the environment on an equal basis with every other objective um, in the trade. So we made that step. Another common complaint was that American workers are falling behind and the government has not changed policies to help them. And I think that's an incredibly valid point. It's at the core, actually, of some of uh, Rob's research about long term, how do we get out of this? How do we build an economy where the middle class and the working poor are not seeing their wages go down? Um, and it's about health care and a better education system and also about getting a new energy policy. Well, we just spent almost $800 billion on that sort of stimulative effect to help American workers. We have health care, but we're taking steps in those areas to address those concerns. So we have listened and try, tried to meet those concerns. As I'm mentioning, I just want to say one thing. This is my, my message point I throw out whenever I can on the education piece. The key to education and workforce training is giving our people, young, old, middle-aged, whatever, applicable skills. That is the weakness in our system. I think there's a little bit of an obsessive focus in some corners on, you know, got to have a college degree, you know, because, you know, that's the, the level of education that's now demanded out there. Maybe, but it depends on what the college degree is, and it depends on whether or not it's applicable to an actual job. That's what we need. In K-12 education, in the community and technical colleges, who, by the way, are the one group out there that I think are doing a really fabulous job. Simon's got a great proposal about how to expand that, taking advantage of the computer services that they have available there. And there are a lot of other good ideas. That's where we've got to place our emphasis. If we're going to have an educated public who can go to work. I mean, I you know, made it all the way through college, degree in political science, all the way through high school. And I really didn't actually know how to do anything at that point. Um, I, I sort of fought my way through that, found a job. Um, but it was a different economy. Um, our young people today cannot afford to be taking high school physics and high school calculus that isn't applicable to something, that doesn't show them here is a job path for you to follow, that doesn't get them very integrated immediately with the businesses in the world who are actually going to employ people and show them the skills that they need to do that. 
that is the type of useful education and job training that we need, and we really need to make changes there. I think there's opportunities, but we need to step up to that. Last thing I want to say is on the international piece, the importance of global poverty and the importance of global development. You know, one of the things we're really going to need to get out of this crisis is partners. And we're seeing that at the G20. Um, the rest of the world is sort of looking at us and going, okay, you were the guys who screwed this whole thing up, and now you're going to show up and tell us what to do. Not going to happen. There's a lot of hostility out there. Um, some of it is probably misplaced. But nevertheless, we don't have the best reputation in the world at precisely the moment when we need it the most to work together in a cooperative way to find a way out of the, the economic box um, that is so snugly um, erected around us right at the moment. And to do that, I think one of the things we need to do is show the world that we care about the fact uh, that 2.7 billion people live on less than $2 a day, that there is such a dramatic difference in wealth, distribution in wealth, that accrues to our benefit and against the rest of the world. You know, we lecture China, we lecture India about you know, human rights or labor conditions or anything. These are two countries that have brought 400 million people out of poverty in the last 20 years. So we need to get an understanding of the fact that the fundamental unfair distribution of wealth and opportunity in this world is a major challenge to stability. And that's how I, I came to this issue, actually, was chairing the Terrorism Subcommittee, working with the Special Operations Command in Iraq, in Afghanistan, but elsewhere, where al-Qaeda-inspired insurgencies were cropping up and trying to deal with them. There's a lot of different ways to deal with them, but at the end of the day, even the special operations guys who are trained to target terrorists and take them out came to understand very quickly that development was a big key to this. If you're going to stop an insurgency in a given country or a given community, if the people there feel like they have opportunity, feel like their government is providing for them, the insurgency finds far, far fewer recruits. They can't get that level of support even if they still cling to their crazy ideology. Um, it simply becomes something that they talk about with each other, not something that they can get people to support them enough to go out and blow themselves up for. This is a key piece of that. And what the U.S. can do right now is actually have a global development strategy, which we don't. Um, you know, there's a lot of focus on the foreign aid budget, and it usually focuses in one of two directions. Either, you know, why are we spending any money on people outside of the U.S. when we have all our problems? Um, I think I've just explained why. But second is those who actually support it, who simply say, we need to spend more. There's a big battle going on in our budget right now over increasing the foreign aid budget. And that's fine, but what I'm more concerned about is what are we spending it on? What's the strategy? We have somewhere between 35 and 40 different agencies in the federal government that have some responsibility for development. They do not coordinate. USAID, which is supposed to be in charge of it, has shrunk to the point where, I guess the best way I ever heard it described was when an article had said that USAID basically right now, they manage contractors. They don't actually do anything. They're simply trying to figure out, okay, we have this pot of money, who are we going to pay to do what it was that we used to do? They are not actively involved. They are a piece of the State Department that is focused on many, many other issues. We need a coordinated development strategy. That was the motivation behind the Global Poverty Act. Um, the idea that we should have a global strategy. Great Britain does this. Um, I could go on a great length about what that strategy is, but suffice it to say, we can do it better, and we need to have it coordinated. And I am growing concerned that despite the fact that President Obama is very committed to this, despite the fact that Secretary of State Hillary Clinton is very committed to this, as is Jack Lew, who's one of her undersecretaries, it's not happening. We don't have a USAID director at the moment. It's April 1st, and I haven't even heard a name recently. Um, nor have we started to pull together a strategy on this. And it's understandable. Um, Secretary of State Clinton has certainly been busy and is working very hard, um, been in Mexico, been in China, been in the Middle East. I think she's in the Netherlands right now doing very, very important work. But that is why we need a strategy, why we need a USAID director. In my opinion, it ought to be cabinet level. At a minimum, it ought to be separate from the State Department that consolidates all or at least most of those development um, agencies that we have right now into one place so we can have a cohesive policy uh, that shows that this is important to us. Because we have learned a lot, I believe, in the last five or ten years about what works in development. That's what's so exciting. When you see the work that the Gates Foundation and Bono and endless other NGOs and governments have been doing, we have really learned how to make a difference in poor communities on global health, on microfinance, on trade and capacity building issues. 
Now we just need to take that knowledge and put it into a coordinated strategy so we can actually start to make a difference on this issue. And that too, I believe, impacts the global economic picture. You know, it's hard to sustain an economy when you have roughly three billion people who aren't participating in it. Um, it goes back to the old Henry Ford maxim of about, does it make sense to have people making my cars who can't afford to buy them? Um, Henry Ford was not a philanthropist. He wasn't looking at his workers saying, gosh, you know, that's unfair. He was looking at his inventory going, who's going to buy this? Um, and the same applies on a global scale. So those are a couple areas that I really think we need to be focused on as we look both short term and long term to get ourselves out of our current economic crisis. Um, and I simply want to close by once again thanking Simon, uh, the work that NDN does. Nobody comprehensively looks at these issues better than the NDN under Simon's leadership. Uh, it's been great to be able to work with him and Rob and others. Look forward to continuing to do so. Thank you. Ensuring that the private sector takes responsibility for its lending decisions and enhancing further the role of the international financial institutions and cooperations between them. That's the essence and then it, it develops. Uh, the, this, is my, this is not the communique, of course. This, uh, but I, don't, I didn't make it up either. This was uh, uh, an, agree, uh, uh, an agreement uh, uh, signed in May uh, of 1998. Uh, by the, you can Google it and you'll find this is the G7 meeting and uh, they agreed to this thing. So tell me, what would you change about this? Nothing. They can just take this and just uh, say it again. And there have been others. And so look around. Every time that there is a, a financial crisis in the world, either the Mexican, the Russian, the Asian, uh, or anyone, we do get uh, meetings, uh, summits, and, and so on that release communiques that are more or less like this. This one that we're going to get uh, in a couple of days, or tomorrow, I guess, uh, is going to say every, every one of these things, except that it's going to emphasize more uh, the need for growth. Uh, there's going to be more emphasis on uh, trying to not uh, to protect the, the, the global trading system from protectionist uh, uh, spurs and so on. Inevitably, all of these uh, uh, communiques, and we have been getting them uh, for a long time since the 90s, emphasize the four points that this one will, will also emphasize. The need for growth and, and protect growth and, and make it balanced. Uh, the need for a global financial architecture. Uh, all of them have always uh, talked about that. When then it becomes, then two things happen. After, uh, after calling for a new redesign of the global uh, financial system, then two things happen. At least two things have happened in the past. One is that uh, the economies tend to recover faster than anticipated, and the urgency 
for reforming the system uh, goes down. And the discovery of the fact that, re that redesigning the financial system is very hard. It's very, very difficult to do. So the next stage in the conversation is that the conversation goes from architecture to plumbing. By that I mean that very soon, because of the intensity uh, of the problems uh, dwindles and the demand for a big architecture or big redesign of the system also goes down, then the plumbers come into the conversation and say, you know, it's not about the architecture, it's the plumbing. Let's look at the rules uh, uh, of the IMF. Let's look at the, some specifics uh, of the system and the wiring of the system and not the entire architecture. Be why? Because changing the entire architecture proves elusive, difficult, costly, and very paralyzing. And uh, I don't know if something like that may happen again. But as I was saying, inevitably it's about growth and sustainable growth and restoring growth, second, protecting uh, uh, the, the, the trading systems from, from uh, emerging obstacles to, to trade. Um, uh, the, the, the need to uh, uh, deal with, the, not to forget the poor is, is also a line that is always there. It's always the, the importance of uh, paying attention to Africa, paying attention to the poor of the world, and uh, be careful about uh, not to get too distracted and, uh, um, and, 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 and forget that there are some very important needs there. The, the point about all of these uh, items is that um, what I'm trying to convey is that these have, these have been problems that have been with us for a long time. Uh, they have acquired uh, a different magnitude, and by no means I'm saying that uh, this current crisis is like the Mexican financial crisis or even the Asian crisis. This is bigger than what we have seen. I think uh, Rob Shapiro's numbers uh, uh, speak to that. Uh, the nature of the crisis is, is, is different, and the consequences are also different. But uh, the, the, the conversations uh, are going to continue. There is a continuity in the conversations about what needs to be done that uh, it, it's there. And what happens is that these conversations are full of passions and interests. Um, there are lots, are, are all of these things and, and the policy choices associated with each one of these five items are full of uh, vested interests that fight very fiercely to defend uh, their privileges, their interests, uh, the status quo, and uh, re you know, change is hard, as, as you know. Uh, and the second is that there are passions, there are intellectual passions, there are ideological passions, there are ways uh, to understand the world, there are models that, 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 that we have about how the world works and how the world should work uh, that get, uh, uh, you know, there's a clash of those views uh, for each one of those uh, items, and, and I don't need to, to, to repeat them, you know what they are. Uh, 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 very briefly, however, on this one, what we have seen is a surge of um, concerning growth. Uh, you know the first uh, debate between the European and uh, uh, US uh, and others' uh, view about how to refloat, and I think Rob Shapiro mentioned it, uh, the, the refloat, uh, the, the reflate versus regulate debate. Uh, Europe is far more interested uh, in getting out of this uh, summit uh, of the G20 very strong uh, commitments to, to strengthen the regulatory system and limit the levels of autonomy uh, and risk that the financial institutions can take. The United States agrees with that, uh, but uh, it also is very keen on getting Europe uh, to, to join the efforts to re-energize growth. And, and as Rob said, only Spain so far has joined in that effort and uh, we have great reluctance uh, on the part of uh, Germany especially, but also of France uh, to join on that. So um, that tells you a lot, not only about the specific politics that each one of these government faces uh, in their countries concerning uh, a, a major expansion of public spending and deficit spending, but also about the intellectual debates about these things. We had thought that that, was, that had been established uh, uh, by Keynes and others after the Great uh, uh, Depression, that one of the lessons was that when you have uh, uh, a, a decline in the cycle, governments ought to do things that are go against the cycle. So that the counter-cyclical, in, in the jargon is called counter-cyclical policies, 
ought to be immediately and, and massively implemented to counter the natural drifts of the economy to, uh, to, to, to deflation, to decline, to, 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 to stagnation. And that uh, those kinds of uh, uh, efforts uh, ought to be quick, ought to be massive, ought to be very important. Um, and in general, economists uh, uh, agree with that. That's one of the rare instances uh, in economics where there's no debate until about a month ago. Uh, and uh, about uh, a month ago, people started questioning this. It is uh, related, of course, to the fact that economists now have a very bad reputation. Uh, there is a legitimacy, uh, there is a very powerful delegitimization, intellectual de lack of legitimacy of what economists say. And the jokes about economists now being the doctors of the economy, except that they are the forensic doctors, uh, <laughs> that uh, are now part of you know, the everyday conversation and so on. And, and that what, uh, then that uh, creates ample opportunities for what I call intellectual populism. Uh, and that is the, 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 the notion that, you know, don't believe anything, there is no one knows anything. Uh, the same people that uh, uh, are recommending uh, what to do now are the people that were, uh, are responsible for where we are now. So there is a, a, a tendency, you can see it in the conversations, you can read it in the newspapers. Uh, about uh, the profound disdain uh, for what is being done uh, that is not only has uh, a political component, but it also has a very important uh, uh, intellectual component. And uh, if you read some of the criticisms that have been leveled against current policymakers in the United States, you know, the list is yeah, they're either idiots or they are not well informed or they are in the pockets of Wall Street or a creative combination of the three. And you know, it so happy, just so happens that the people that they're talking about are some of the most respected profession, professionals in the in the in in, in, in the world. Uh, you know, you, Riley Summers and uh, Ben Bernanke and others are uh, very respected, very decent uh, individuals that I don't believe are in the pockets of Wall Street. I don't think they're idiots. I don't think they're ignorant, and I don't think they are less informed that by the than the people that write editorials and op-ed uh, pages. Um, so, but th this is just a symptom of uh, what I, I think is a very dangerous uh, trend for that I call intellectual uh, uh, populism. And finally, and I'm, I, I ran out of time, I just wanted to mention that one of the concrete uh, 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 outcomes that we're gonna get out of this meeting uh, is uh, added resources uh, to the IMF, I think that's gonna happen. And that then uh, goes with the pressures and demands uh, for the IMF to change its ways and also to change uh, perhaps its governance structures. Again, the interesting point about this is not only that it's a good idea and necessary, but this is something we have been talking about for, you know, for a long time. And uh, I think now we're gonna get uh, some of that and that's uh, uh, good news. And so this summit is gonna deliver uh, more than in the past, thanks to the crisis, but far less than what's needed in order to really tackle the crisis. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. And for anyone who's watching, uh, if you'd like to send a question in to questions at uh, ndn.org, uh, you can do so. Uh, and we, last time we did this, we actually got a lot of questions from our audience outside the room. And, but let's, uh, let's start, so we'll just open it up to folks in the room who would like to begin. And if you can, we have mics because we are webcasting this so the folks at home uh, can hear this as well. Who'd like to begin? Yes, sir. Um, my name is Paul Lundberg. Let, let me uh, just ask a question for Rob. Uh, you pointed out something that I think is very important. That is that it's not just that the banks won't lend, it is that borrowers are much uh, more suspect than they used to be. And uh, that is, it's not clear that people can pay you back, so even big companies like GE are in significant uh, trouble. So <coughs> there's probably pretty good reason why people won't lend or why banks are holding back. Um, it seems to me that during the Depression, one of the things, if, if you want to stimulate demand, you may have to create not only better lenders, 
but better borrowers. Uh, set up things like authorities that have uh, some ability to set up sinking funds that can do what the TVA did or smaller groups like that. I, I have never heard anybody talk very much about this. I mean, Felix Rowett in New York always talked about a, an energy authority. But I wonder if anybody is doing any thinking about the development of authorities which can borrow and which will be solid borrowers uh, so that banks uh, may be more disposed to lend the money or financial institutions. <coughs> to be green. Yeah. There's three colors, but you have to be. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting idea. Um, you know, we are moving into various forms of that. We have, <clears throat> in the banking plan, we're guaranteeing the loans of the people buying the toxic assets. The government is guaranteeing those. Um, and, um, uh, you know, part of the problem here, uh, and I suppose if this Look, the, the difference between, you know, I call this the Great Recession. Uh, the difference between a Great Recession and a Great Depression is sustained policy error. Um, and, it's, and you can get to sustained policy error either because you don't understand it, which was what happened in the 30s, and indeed we nearly came out of the Depression twice and drove ourselves back into it with bad policy. That happened both in... 32, and it happened again in 36-7. Uh, we tightened in both cases. Um, we know not to do that this time. But you can get sustained policy error because, um, because the right policies are too difficult politically as well. I think that's closer to where we are today, right, frankly. Um, and we haven't made it to the right policies yet. I, I believe that this administration if, if, as I suspect and a lot of other economists suspect, the housing plan and the banking plan are not sufficient, that as that becomes clear in three or four months, they will move to stronger action um, and that they will try to force through actually what we have to do. But if they are incapable of that, you have the same result as sustained policy error. And um, and, and then you have the danger of, you know, something that goes on five, six years and is very deep um, and incredibly damaging to the economy, incredibly damaging. Um, you know, we have um, enormous fundamental strengths in this economy, human capital, physical capital, innovation. Um, those things all deteriorate over periods of time if they are not continually replenished. And that's what can happen in a Great Depression. It's not just that you lose, you know, you lose the possibility, the opportunity for growth, it's that you depress the whole base of the economy for a long time. Um, and um, uh, if we come to the point at which that begins to look like a possibility, then, then, you, then you begin looking at, at much more radical uh, steps. Um, and such as, you know, much broader guarantees for lending. Um, and, um, uh, you know, if, if we get to that point, the economy is, when we come out of it, it's not going to look much like the economy today. We are still holding on to the basic neoliberal approach to economics um, through this. Um, that is, we have not moved to social democracy. Um, and, uh, but if, look, neo, neoliberal economics failed uh, with respect to the financial system. Uh, and I don't, you know, there's no other way to describe what happened. And um, uh, if it fails in the recovery, um, then, um, then we'll end up with a different approach to the relationship between government and the economy. Right, yeah. I just want to add one thing to that, Paul, and this is, you know, Rob and I wrote an essay uh, four years ago <coughs> called Crafting a Better CAFTA, and it was during the CAFTA debate, and it was about the idea that because America had been going through, in, during the Bush recovery, a period of sustained GDP growth, sustained productivity growth, at that point corporate profits were high and the market was doing well, 
and incomes had gone down and wages had stagnated, which for the, anyone who has studied classical economics, right, that's not supposed to be possible, and is that you would have a period of sustained productivity growth higher in this decade than in the 90s, by the way, and incomes went down. I mean, in the, in the Clinton era, a typical family in, saw their median income go up $8,000. Under Bush, the typical income went down over $1,000 during a period of economic growth. And remember that before the recession began, right track, wrong track, the polling question about whether the country's on the right track or the wrong track, was at 81% wrong track, the highest ever recorded, before the recession began. Because the recession began in the American middle class in the middle of this decade. And then I think the thing that we haven't completely factored in to our understanding of where we are in the US is that the American consumer experience during this decade has been one where they saw their wages and income stagnate or go down, their assets inflated dramatically, they borrowed off of those assets, the assets have collapsed, they still have the debt, they still have, they have now fear of unemployment, right, which if in a two wage owner, wage earner family, if one person loses their job, they lose their house, right, because they can't afford the mortgage. And you've got a, a, posi a, a a, a huge question, I think, about sort of how does demand, is the American, the mighty American consumer going to come back? Or is the responsible thing to do in this new era of responsibility that we all live in for American consumers to get their balance, home balance sheets in order, meaning paying down debt and not buying anything for the next three to five years, right? And if that happens, which is not an unreasonable thing to do if you owe a lot of money and you got to, and credit card rates are being, you know, gouged up to 30% in some cases. I mean, the banks are not acting responsibly with consumers right now. We don't have a new day between the American banking system and consumers, the American financial system. They're still you know, trying to squeeze as much juice out of the American consumer orange that they possibly can, right, for their own balance sheets. There is a real question about how much, and this gets to what Rob didn't say, which he could have, is, you know, do we need a massive secondary stimulus? I mean, because to- Oh, I've always said we need another right, stimulus. Right, right. <laughs> in order, because the, the demand, the demand, the, the, the gap in demand, right, is gonna be so dramatic. And I think this question of, of, of and, and I will be, you know, and I, I think that there has been an incredible lack of understanding in the political and economic elites in the United States about what happened to the American middle class in the Bush era. It has been the central issue defining American politics since 2005. It's what pushed the Republicans out of office in 2006. It certainly was the central issue that pushed John McCain out of the campaign in 2008. And it is the central issue still driving American politics today. And I think this administration has been caught a little by the populism that has exploded. And the reason why is guys like Geithner and Froman and others, all of my friends, all of our dear friends, right, don't, I don't think have really incorporated adequately the understanding of what had happened to the American middle class prior to the recession and the financial collapse. The anger existed, the anger, frustration, concern existed long before the recession began, which is why you're seeing tens and tens of thousands of people in London today. I mean, there is, there is tremendous uh, anxiety, I think, in, in the American middle class that existed long before this crisis. And I think we have to factor that into the economic analysis in order to understand how to get out of this. And one of the things that Rob wrote recently is this idea that we're not in a normal V-shaped, you know, recovery. And, and if you look at the, the Obama budget, you know, they count on 4% GDP growth next year, right? And the only person in the United States who thinks we're gonna have 4% GDP growth next year is Peter Orzak, right? I mean, there's not another, the CBO radically rejected this and sort of, and, 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 what's, and what's troubling, I think, and I'll end with this, is that Dr. Naeem said this, is that there, there is one group in the United States who's holding firm to this notion, the Merkel-Sarkozy strategy, which is the Republican Party. I mean, the Republicans today announced their, the House Republicans announced their budget, which called for an immediate domestic spending freeze for the next five years and holding all domestic spending, playing deep, you know, right into the hands of, of you know, the not reinflating the economy in a time of tremendous demand collapse. And we have, you know, we have a great challenge domestically, which is the Republican Party has become irresponsible and crazy at a moment of tremendous national crisis, which may be continuing where they've been for this decade already, right? But I think that they are not, they are not moving towards becoming a responsible partner, making Obama's challenge, I think, that much greater. Other questions? And if we have, uh, when we get questions from the, the internet, let us know. Yes, sir. Thanks. Hi, my name is Steve Brandt. I'm from New York City. And um, Rob, I wanted to key on a comment you said 
which is that we have no model for this. Mm. And I come from a design background, and what I see is that this is not just a, a bigger version of some past cycle, this is the end of a historic cycle. If you look at economics being a product of culture, see, I'm not an economist, but I study cultural evolution, and we've got a global situation that is no longer a world of Darwinian competition because we have this sense that we are all one interdependent human family. And we have, through the sustainability movement, the recognition that growth at all costs is actually not good, but the sustainable use of resources and development, development not being the same as growth, is what we need. So in economics, based on the end of Darwinian competition and, glo and global cooperation, and the end of growth being the uh, pot of gold at the end of the rainbow and development, replacing that is this new model that some people are starting to talk about, but they're not traditional economists, because traditional economists don't, I think, come from this cultural change perspective. You're all sort of stuck in thinking that the world hasn't had a fundamental cultural change. So I'd like to ask you to talk about the notion of this mess being solved when we think in terms of an economics of collaboration and sustainability rather than competition and growth. Thanks. Well, I, um, you know, I, I, uh, I don't, I, my own view is that kind of competition and the desire for growth is kind of not a cultural phenomenon, but a more of a human phenomenon. But um, we don't have to argue that. W what's important here is that any, any large upheaval in an economy or a political system um, reveals new preferences and needs. And you can identify them and use them to try to uh, motor your way out of where you are. Um, you know, I spoke to a group of private equity managers a little while ago, and um, I said, God, you know, this should be the best of all times for you guys. This, uh, you know, they were all moaning about how they couldn't get financing for their big deals. I said, there are thousands and thousands of companies that need your financing now, small companies um, that have, you know, that are, whose, whose competitors are falling by the wayside, so there are new market opportunities, you know, this should be a great time for you guys if you begin to think of it in those terms. Well, uh, the same thing is true, you know, if, if in fact our certain uh, traditional industries in the United States, that the weaknesses of those industries has now been starkly revealed by the economic downturn, you know, I think of autos is kind of the obvious case, but it's, it may be true in a lot of other areas too. I'm pretty shocked that GE is in trouble, for example. Um, well, there are, you know, there are new industries that can, that, that we need to refocus investment in human capital on for which we know there will be a significant demand. Um, uh, one of them is obviously uh, less carbon intensive energy um, uh, sources and less energy intensive technology uh, to deal with climate change. Um, and, you know, I think that, and indeed, as kind of old industries fail, that releases a lot of capital. And, human and physical, that can shift into, into new areas that can try to drive you out of, this kind of, out of this kind of problem. I hope, for example, you know, one thing which is, look, in a, one of the things we're going to face, we're, we're going to face a whole series of problems, really hard problems, that arise out of our responses to this crisis. Not to the crisis, but to the responses to the crisis. One is the prospect of inflation three to five years down the road, which, will, which arises out of what we're doing to the monetary base. We're going to try to pull some of that back. We can't pull it all back without driving the economy down again. Um, another is going to be an enormous financing crisis, global. I do not, I, I am not convinced there will be enough global savings to meet all the global financing demand um, a year from now. And that means the normal result of that is higher interest rates, which is, that is, the price of the capital goes up, not exactly what you want in the midst of a glow, deep global recession. 
um, a, um, uh, well, the, in the face of that financing problem, the largest issue for the United States is health care, um, is the cost of health care, and which is already, you know, it rises two or three times the rate of inflation and has for 35 years, and now it's about to collide with, with the retirement of the boomers, which matters because cancers and heart disease is highly concentrated in people 60 and over. Um, uh, well, this can be the kind of impetus for um, deep reform that we've never considered in healthcare in order to contain the rate of, rate of, rate of increase in cost. Because, you know, as Ben, the late economist Ben Stein said, kind of very memorably, um, unsustainable trends end. <laughs> They're unsustainable. Um, and so we're going to have to say, you know, this is, this is about the, the, the economic stability of the United States, which has been revealed by this crisis. We cannot sustain this kind of health care, rise in health care costs any longer. And now we're going to consider whole different ways of approaching this, because we have no choice. May I intrude in your answer? Um, um, I don't know if the assertion that uh, Darwin, you called it economic Darwinism and uh, the hope for growth or the go having growth as a goal. I don't know if that's your prescription, that's your diagnosis of what's going on, or that's your hope. Uh, but one needs to be very careful not to extrapolate to the rest of the world what you may feel in New York. Go and tell uh, millions of Chinese that are more than competing more than ever that instead of growing at 12 percent, they're going to grow at zero because that's better for them. Or go tell that to the Indians that have become a very powerful force in the world for commerce and trade and growth. Uh, disdaining growth is a luxury that only uh, some Americans and some Europeans can indulge us, and not all of them. Go tell to the people that are going to be laid off in Detroit that growth is not really cool. That it's better, and that it's better not to be that competitive. That it's the ruinian thing is really not that great. That we better, you know, stop competing and stop being Darwinian, and hold hands with Saab. Okay, good. Uh, but but, but uh, all I'm, no, but there is. Uh, I am actually using that that, that point to, to be to, to essentially. It's very easy in Washington and New York to get carried away uh, by perspectives that are dominant here but have absolutely no bearing in the experiences, hopes, and votes, and political behaviors of uh, peoples around the world. And in fact, just one final comment on that is that <coughs> it's been in the end analysis that global competition is going to radically increase uh, in future years because of the coming online, the rise of the rest, as Farid Zakaria has called it, and that in fact, the strongest argument I think Barack Obama has for his budget is that we, if we want to maintain the standard of living that we have, we have to do more. And if we stay, if we stay the status quo, if we keep the course where we were seeing declining wages and incomes in the United States, if we want to accept that as the inevitable reality of where we're headed, it's fine. But I think that in order for us to imagine again growing standards of living in the United States, we're going to have to do more. We're going to have to compete harder. We're going to have to uh, recognize that this rise of the rest, which was a central goal of American foreign policy for 60 years, and that we are more singularly responsible for than any country in the world, has happened. And what that means is that, you know, and the population of the world has, you know, uh, increased by fourfold in the last 100 years. And it means that there are now, you know, billions of people who want their shot at the global dream, the American dream, whatever you want to call it. And there, there's no putting that genie back in the bottle. And I think that for us, I think one of the great awakenings for us, and I was in Chile last week at this Progressive Governance Conference where I listened to many speeches about the death of neoliberalism and, and uh, from South American uh, leaders. But I think what was really clear to me in that meeting was the notion that you know, America is, I really think, facing an, an unprecedented moment in its history which is that we've become seen as being an exporter of chaos as opposed to an exporter of stability, prosperity, uh, and modernity. 
And between what happened with Iraq, uh, which was the action of a, a drunken, out-of-control superpower who had no real care, as Rob calls it, or what's happened where we're being blamed now for exporting this you know, global financial crisis, that our brand has been uh, really weakened in a way that I think is very hard for an American to really come, come to terms with, uh, at a time where the rest of the world has also become much more competitive. And so I think that our job as a nation in the, in the next generation is that we got a lot of work to do. And, and, I, and I think the, the good news is, as Rob said, is that what may be happening is we're accelerating the death of elements of the 20th century economy that needed to go away in order to allow a rebirth, a phoenix-like rebirth of this 21st century economy that has to be built with higher skills, be more low carbon in its, in its orientation, that is recognizing that competition is more intense, so we have to invest more in infrastructure, in schools, radically improving all elements of what I call learning as opposed to education. I mean, we really do have to make this commitment to continuous improvement in learning as an entire society. I think there's a, diff a whole different way of viewing how we go forward that I think we have a real opportunity. And I think Barack is halfway there. I mean, to his credit, I think he's way ahead of everybody else, in, in certainly way ahead of Congress, in understanding that this is a transformational moment and not a moment of recovery. We don't want to go back to where we were. Where we were was declining wages and incomes for the United States, for American workers, right? The recovery, I think, is the worst word we can possibly use in this discussion because we, don't, we have to go forward and use this opportunity for transformation. And I think that that's where I think Barack understands this. The question is, how does he bring along the United States and the rest of the world? And I think that's going to be one of the great challenges for him. So let me, yes, sir, please. Oh, hey, John, there you are. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Don Means, Digital Village. Uh, let's pick up on this uh, uh, point about uh, growth and the view of growth in the developing world. You mentioned that, uh, the, that, that, that Fannie and Freddie uh, had uh, serious uh, investors in Europe. I mean, you didn't mention that uh, China also was holding a lot of, a lot of their paper as well and, and weighed in on that. Uh, but the, uh, uh, the point of carbon, let's, let's just say, or sustainability, if you want to put it another way, in opposition with growth, I mean, at the... At the individual level, it's a very difficult thing to perceive climate challenges. You're looking at your daily family issue. These are sort of macro uh, level priorities that uh, seem to be in opposition with goals for growth. And you're trying to restrain people from doing what they're doing today, which is delaying uh, a resolution of, of that uh, trend that you say must end, but we've been surprised how many trends uh, last much, much longer than we've uh, predicted. Then they're not unsustainable. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I don't, I, if I take your question correctly, I don't think that um, a serious response to climate change has to impair growth. Um, a, um, we've, uh, I both for work here and I chair a little group called the U.S. Climate Task Force and uh, we've tried to promote a tax shift approach, which is a shift Al Gore has endorsed. He endorsed it in his, in his Nobel uh, uh, lecture. He endorsed it in Earth and the Balance, uh, in which we apply a tax to energy based upon its carbon content and rebate all the revenues to individuals either in payments or in cuts in the payroll tax. So you maintain demand. The, the goal is not to reduce the use of energy. The goal is to reduce the use of carbon intensive energy and create incentives for people to move to less carbon intensive forms of energy and set a price on carbon, that's the tax, that allows businesses to to figure out what makes economic sense to invest in for in alternative fuels and uh, uh, alternative technology. So I don't think that there, I, I personally think the cap and trade proposal would impair growth. I think it has a lot of problems, actually, cap and trade. Uh, I wrote and I have a blog today on NDN on that, uh, that the notion of creating a new trillion dollar market of financial instruments to be traded and derivatized and securitized 
one which we know would be subject to enormous speculation because the cap in cap and trade creates volatility in energy prices. So we know there'll be enormous speculation in these instruments. Uh, the notion of doing this today is, is fantastic to me. It's, and it's politically fantastic. Uh, the country will not tolerate Congress creating this new trillion dollar market uh, for Wall Street. And Wall Street has been the primary backers of cap and trade. Um, so I think that proposal would not work. I do think a carbon-based tax system does work uh, or can work. Um, I don't, again, I don't think we have any choice with respect to addressing climate change. It uh, doesn't mean we have to address it this year. It means we have to address it over the next several years. But this is a, this is, you know, it's again, it, you know, it's hitting up against science. It's, you know, against net natural processes, which we can't change simply by ignoring them. Um, so um, uh, uh, the tough thing is that whenever you put in place any new large policy, um, there's always a complicated distribution of winners and losers. There will be under any climate change regime as well. Um, and so there's a tendency to make the program, the response, to nibble away at it more and more in order to protect everybody. Um, we need to find a way to protect the basic interests of West Virginia and Pennsylvania and Ohio without while still uh, driving uh, very large long-term reductions in emissions. Well, um, it's a, uh, frankly, and we can't do this today, but um, bringing China and India into a climate regime of some kind. I, I don't think we need a harmonized global system. I think we need each country committing to a goal and figuring out how to do it the way they want to do it. Um, but it's going to involve very large technology transfers from the United States to China and India. Um, I actually think the thing which really appeals to me, and I think might appeal to the Chinese, would be uh, offering joint ventures in the, in the development of these technologies and fuels. Um, give them part of the global market uh, and um, uh, in order to join, because if we cannot bring China and India into it, it doesn't, mean, it doesn't matter what we do. Um, and let me say that both China and India have said repeatedly they will never accept a cap and trade regime. I, I have one question that I, as, a, as the chair, and we'll, we'll go about 10 more minutes. Is Dr. Naeem, what, what would be, as, you, as we discussed now, and you said we've been talking about these changes in the global financial architecture and giving the rising powers a greater seat at the table. I, um, what, what could that possibly look like in the next five to ten years? How do we understand China has clearly been in the last few weeks exerting themselves in the, in the global debate in ways they really haven't in, in a long time. We know that part of what's holding up Doha is the struggle between the U.S. and India, for example, in a very specific set of negotiations. So in these two instances, you've already seen the Chinese and the Indians exerting themselves to, in ways they haven't in previous regimes. We know that Lula Brazil is both rhetorically uh, and, uh, and uh, politically exerting himself to, uh, much more than he had in, in the past. What could, what, are, what, what could it look like in the next five to 10 years, do you think? Uh, the, the premise is I don't know. Uh, and um, and I, I don't think anybody knows because it's not clear that uh, the outcome of all this is a, is a profound decline of the United States and the emergence of others. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that others are uh, hurting uh, as deeply and more than the United States. Uh, Russia, for example, is uh, one of the countries that has suffered the most as a result of this economic crisis. Uh, it's not clear that China has, uh, it, it all depends on what, it's all, all this conversation is very sensitive to uh, our assumption about how long and how deep this recession is. If this goes on uh, for a long time and it becomes very deep, then China uh, begins to st struggle in very fundamental ways. Uh, the legitimacy of the Chinese government rests on growth and employment generation. 
if that stops, uh, then there will be very unpredictable political developments in China that can create all sorts of dynamics that will make China a different player in the global system, both for be better and for worse. Same with Europe and so on. You can go down the list, Brazil, you mentioned. You can go down the list and, and, and discover scenarios that in a prolonged uh, uh, economic downturn will make these countries, uh, the, the, the prediction that you know the United States goes down and everybody goes up, it may, may not pan uh, exactly like that. Uh, one area that I, I think we can be certain uh, that is going to be a different uh, regime is the financial system. Uh, I think banks are going to be de-risked. De uh, banks are going to be, uh, they, 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 they we're going to have far more financial regulations. I think that the point about the neoliberal system has failed in the financial uh, markets is, 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 is one that is in people's mind and that is going to spur a uh, very significant uh, amount of regulation that will make it very hard for some institutions mm -hmm. uh, to continue doing what they're doing. And those institutions, the prime targets for that are going to be banks. Banks in the future are going to look, taste, feel, behave more like utilities than banks. So when you think about a bank in the future, think about your electricity company, your power company, you know, have heavily regulated, very stable, uh, boring, slow uh, growth, no returns, uh, you know, um, no risk, uh, and, and so on. Meanwhile, meanwhile, another shadow financial system will emerge uh, that is going to have uh, uh, a lot of tools and a lot of money to play games. Uh, the people, uh, the wizards of uh, Wall Street that are now sitting in Greenwich with billions of dollars in dry powder, not, not everyone has lost half of their 401k. You know, there are people that have lots of money that uh, uh, in, in, in a lot of countries uh, that, are, that have the technology, have the money, have the institutional capabilities to, and they're not gonna go to Mars. They're here. Uh, and they're going to operate in a system that thanks to regulation is going to create wonderful opportunities. <laughs> so if in the past the excessive reliance of markets created the opportunity for people to become overnight billionaires, the excessive reliance in governments and regulation is going to create wonderful opportunities for speculators and people that are close to governments and know how to uh, game the system that is going to be created. And finally, um, that goes together in a contradictory and complex way with uh, one kind of protectionism that is not potential but real, and that is financial protectionism. Uh, whereas we are all worried about, and rightly so, about the need to, to contain uh, any propensity that uh, this crisis will spur in terms of protectionism around the world. Uh, and, and the protectionism for goods is there, and it's, but uh, it's not there yet, is what I meant to say. The, the, the anxiety is there. But we have not seen uh, very fundamental uh, uh, examples of protectionism. We have seen noises. We have seen elements, the Buy American you know, uh, clause in the, in, the, in, in, the, in the recovery here, you know, forcing uh, you know, bridges with only can, can only be built with American US-made steel. And, and, and things like that. We have seen some of that, but you cannot argue that the world has entered into a major protectionist phase. You can argue on, in terms of, 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 of goods, but you can argue that the world has entered into a major profound protectionist stage in financial uh, uh, markets. It's, uh, we are living already uh, in, a sta in a world where uh, international financial integration is going to be far more limited. And the obstacles, the government imposed <coughs> obstacles to financial, uh, to international financial integration are huge. Are, are go it's gonna take years to, to, to take them out, uh, if at all. And, uh, and you know, as, as governments have uh, bailed out their financial systems, they have also ring-fenced them uh, uh, against uh, the presence of foreigners. So if you are, that sounds great, except you know, if you are a strong, sound, smart Canadian bank that has been doing things well, and Canadian banks have do, been doing things, and now you want to 
uh, operate in the United States or in Spain or in one of the European countries. And you have to compete against rivals that are either owned by the state or have all sorts of government guarantees and that are offering their depositors you know, complete insurance. So the potential of a strong, competitive, healthy bank to operate in an unhealthy financial system has been disappeared. And that's one of the collateral damages of, of, of this financial bailout. Why don't we end with final thoughts? Little over time. Okay. Uh, back to my instrument. Um, look, this is uh, <laughs> these are the times that really test uh, test societies. They test all of us. They test how smart we are. They test how how much we can step out of our normal conceptions and see change. Uh, and they they will test our ability to adapt to what we figure out. Um, and um, you know, the United States has generally been pretty good about this. Um, we accept change pretty well, um, and we tend to be quite realistic. Um, but um, that's hard when you're in the midst of a big shock, and we are in the midst of a big shock. Um, I'm, you know, I, I have been gently critical of the administration's approaches, but um, uh, I am perfect. I, I want to give them time. This is a really, it's a lot of shock for them, in addition to the shock of coming to power. Um, uh, I think that we, I hope that, um, particularly within the Democratic Party, given that the Republican Party has moved into kind of reflexive opposition uh, to whatever the administration does, that we can give the administration enough space uh, to feel its way to um, a set of responses that can actually put the country on um, uh, a road to the next stage. And uh, Simon, I, I, I agree with Simon entirely. The best thing about the administration's approaches is that outside the, the, the areas of finance and housing, they have recognized the fundamental areas that we need to reform in order to create a next business cycle that doesn't look like the last business cycle, and that is profound reform in health care and energy policy and education. Um, and we really need to support them in that, too. Uh, well, thank you both very much. And thanks to Adam Smith, who had to run and go vote. And uh, thanks to all of you for coming today. And obviously, there'll be more. Stay in touch. You, we blog uh, every day, probably too much, uh, at nbnblog.org. And also, to be sure, if you haven't, check out the new online version of Foreign Policy magazine. It's really one of the most innovative, I think, thoughtful new intellectual endeavors uh, in town. And uh, it's certainly something worth checking out. So thank you both very much.